Good evening, brothers and sisters in Christ. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ and take this opportunity to the WFCMC uh, to, for the invitation extended to me to give uh, the three talks during this conference. Let us go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us together in this manner. And we pray that as we gather around your word, that you will bring us together into your presence as your Holy Spirit takes your word and plants it in the depths of our hearts, that we may hear, understand, believe, and obey. Speak to us, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that we hear repeatedly in our Holy Communion ritual is the part of the ritual where there's a prayer to the Father that by the power of His Spirit, He may make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. That's a very beautiful prayer, and the phrases bring to us some important themes. And that's exactly what we are going to do in the three talks. One with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. So in this first session, we will be looking at the phrase, one with Christ, because without that, the rest cannot follow. One with Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ described himself as the true vine. And in uh, John chapter 15, that's what we read in verse 1, I am the true vine, the Lord Jesus said. We understand this when we uh, look at some Old Testament passages like Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1 to verse 7, as well as Isaiah chapter 27, verse 2 to verse 6, where God describes Israel as a vineyard, a vineyard. But unfortunately, Israel failed God. And this is where Jesus comes into the picture to fulfill God's eternal plans by becoming the true vine of Israel. And so here he says, I am the true vine and you are the branches. Our hope is in being grafted or connected to the divine vine. That is central in our Christian understanding. And Jesus teaches about the relationship between him and us and makes some very important statements, one of which is what we are going to explore this evening. And that statement is found in John 15 verse 5, where Jesus says, Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now that comes as a potentially rude shock, perhaps for many, because of the word nothing. Nothing. Nothing does not mean uh, something that is uh, uh, not visible. Nothing. For there are many who are busy doing things in this world, achieving much and receiving great applause in this world as doers and movers and shakers. But it is possible to do much without Christ. It is possible to do much without Christ. But it is impossible to do anything of spiritual or eternal significance without being connected with Christ. And that is why Jesus in verse 4 in John 15 says, no branch can bear fruit by itself. And so the principle is very clear that on our own, we can be very busy, but ultimately measured in the light of eternity, 
it will all not be significant. It is only as we are connected with Christ that we can hope to do anything or whatever God wants us to do that is eternally significant. The teacher who wrote Ecclesiastes writes from philosophical observation. And so in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 14, he writes, I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Vanity, a word repeated again and again in Ecclesiastes and elsewhere, vanity is a word that often occurs in this particular book that the teacher wrote. Now Paul also wrote something about how each one's work will be tested on the day of judgment. He wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 to verse 15. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 15. He compares the man who builds on Christ the foundation with gold and silver and costly stones. He compares that with another who builds with combustible material such as wood, hay and straw. The first kind of work will survive and stand but the other kind of work will be burnt up and be lost forever. It is a terrifying feeling to realize that one has achieved nothing of value on that day. I remember a senior church member came to see me. He had spent many years, decades serving the Lord. And after he had retired and uh, he was not involved very much, in the work he used to do, he was in despair because he felt he had wasted his life. All that he did for God, it seemed like it was not worth at all and that he had wasted his time and his life and he was very afraid, in terror almost, to think about how he would stand in the presence of God. So I had to spend time talking to him, praying with him, uh, and helping him along in his journey. Now, here in John 15, we come across what may be called an essential connection. This connection is a must for every Christian, if we are to be Christians, and if we are to do things that really matter in eternity, this essential connection is important. For us to be able to do anything of significance, we need to be intimately connected to Christ. This is the essential connection. It is impossible to live the Christian life without this connection. Martin Luther defined faith as being united with Christ. What is faith? Faith is being united with Christ. Very important concept. And it's not just Martin Luther's idea because it comes from the Bible. If you read Romans chapter 6, the Apostle Paul, while reflecting and writing about baptism, he wrote in verse 5 of Romans chapter 6, he said, For if we have been united with Him, with Christ, in a death like His, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. So for Paul, the whole picture of baptism is really about being baptized into death with Christ and being raised to new life with Christ. So this whole thing has to do with being united with Christ. That's what makes us Christians And Martin Luther said it is that kind of faith that unites us with Christ, that justifies us and brings us to a new dimension of life. It is possible not to experience this union with Christ, even though we may go through the motions of baptism, because Paul is referring here 
not just to an outward ritual, but also to an inner reality. So we need to be united with Christ. That essential connection is important. There was a missionary in a, uh, one of the islands in the Pacific who was uh, doing God's work and then uh, he was also a gardener, so he loved to plant plants and take care of them. So he bought a new set of plants and then he received an urgent message that he is needed somewhere else and he had to pack up his bags and leave immediately. So as he was leaving, his replacement arrived and uh, he told his replacement all about the work that he was doing. And then he also said, oh, by the way, I just bought some new plants and I've just planted them in the garden. And can you please water them and take care of them? So the new missionary remembered that. And so every day he was watering the plants. But to his horror, he noticed that the, the more he watered, the more they uh, wilted. And soon they were about to die. So he felt that something is terribly wrong here. Uh, what's gone wrong? So he decided to pull up the plants to dig and, and to see what's, what's the matter. And then to his horror, he found out that his predecessor had left in such a hurry that he did not remove the plastic sheet that covered the roots of each plant. So he had just, in a hurry, just put them into the soil, covered up with the soil and left. So now the new missionary decided that it's time to rescue the plants. He removed the plastic covering and then replanted the plants. And you know, as soon as he did that, he began to water and the plants began to spring up to life. So sometimes, you know, our connection with Christ is not quite there. We are close to the things of God, but because it remains an external kind of thing, that we find that in such a person, there is no real spiritual life. For that to happen, our hearts need to be exposed to the blood of Christ, to the grace of God, to the mercy of God, so that we become united with Christ. That connection is very important, very central. And it is not just the initial connection, but continuing connection that is important. That's why Jesus said in verse 4 of John 15, He said, the branch must remain in the vine. The branch must remain in the vine. The Greek word is the word meno. Meno is translated as abide in some translations and it's translated as remain in the NIV. And the word means to live, to make our home, to wait for something, to endure without yielding, to bear patiently, to accept without objection, to remain stable or fixed in a state, to continue in a place. I suppose it's for us the most difficult thing is to be nailed to the cross, to remain on the cross. That's a crucified life. We abide through the cross of committed love as we learn to remain in Christ. The depth of this abiding is described by the Lord Jesus in a wonderful way. In verse 4, he says, Remain in me, and I will remain in you. And then in verse 5, he says, If a man remains in me, and I in him. So there is a kind of a mutual remaining. We in Christ and Christ in us. And he compares this remaining of the believer in Christ to his remaining in the Father. In other words, the, the, the way Jesus remains in the Father is the model and standard 
for the way that we remain in Christ, which is a very high standard. We ought to remain in Christ in a deep way, just as Christ remains in the Father. Now, this is a very high calling. And this desire of Jesus becomes clearer when we come across the high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, where the Lord Jesus prays for himself, for his disciples, and for all the future generations of Christians. So here, Jesus prays in John 17, 21. He said, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. Now, this is a mystery because the, the quality of the remaining that Jesus talks about is a Trinitarian quality. It's a divine quality. And we ought to remain in Christ the way the Father remains in Christ and Christ remains in, in, in Him. And that's why Jesus goes into mystery in verse 23, John 17, where He says, I in them and you in me. So after a while, you, you don't know who is in who. Because this mutual indwelling is a central mystery and uh, a central dimension of the Christian life. Technically, theologically, we use the term perichoresis to describe the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit within the Trinity, perichoresis, which means basically uh, a mutual act of self giving love as each person in the Trinity flow into each other. So some people describe it as the divine dance and they flow into one another in this wonderful way and then they invite us to do the same as when we become Christians. They invite us to come into the divine perichoresis and to learn how to remain in Christ even as Christ remains in us. This mutual abiding between the believer and Christ is a deep and profoundly intimate relationship, patterned after the Trinitarian relationship. Now, there are two ways of describing this that we often use in our Christian language. Sometimes we say Christ is in us. And sometimes we say, we are in Christ. And both are biblical. Christ in us, the hope of glory, the Apostle Paul wrote. And then we are also to be in Christ. The, the phrase in Christ happens at least 140 times in the New Testament, especially a favorite phrase of the Apostle Paul. We are called to live in Christ. So what's the difference? Are they the same? Is it the same to say that Christ is in us uh, when we also say that we are in Christ? In some sense, it's the two sides of the same coin, but I think there are some differences. When we say Christ in us, we can think of uh, our evangelistic methods where we often use uh, verses like Revelation 3.20, the Lord is standing at the door of our heart, and if we open the door of our heart, He will come in, and uh, He will sub eat with us, and we will eat with Him. And so He comes into our hearts. And uh, often, we, when we are leading somebody to Christ, we do the same. We ask them to invite Christ into their hearts to make sure that Christ is in them. And that's very true. But we also come across the phrase, in Christ. What does that mean? To be in Christ. And one possible way to understand this is the way we refer to the solar system, for example. So you have a solar system, and uh, you decide what is in the solar system. And whatever is in the solar system actually goes around the sun. 
and it is controlled by the sun through its gravity, force of gravity. So no matter how far they are, they're all circling around the sun. The sun is ruling the solar system. And that's what it means to be in Christ. To say I am in Christ means that I am in the kingdom of God where Christ is king and I'm circling around him. He is in the center of my life. He commands, I obey, and I just go around him again and again. That's to be in Christ. Now, interesting, in the solar system, you do have visitors. Not residents, but visitors. And these are the ones like asteroids who will come from outside the solar system and then come into the system and then leave the solar system. So they are basically visitors. Now that's, if you take that example, it's possible to think we are in Christ, but we are actually not dwelling in Christ. We are just merely visitors accidentally here and there. We are visiting the kingdom of God, but we do not have an ongoing abiding relationship with Christ. So the metaphors and the prepositions in the Bible are very important. Christ in us and we in Christ. These two experiences are very important and help us to understand what it means to remain in Christ. Now, Jesus also warned against the consequences of losing this connection because he did say in verse 6 in John 15, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. Now that's a very dire warning. Because if one no longer remains in Christ, he will become useless and will lose all. One of the distinctives, distinctives of our Wesleyan doctrine is that we are never to be presumptuous about our relationship with Christ. We are constantly challenged to be faithful to Christ and to work out our salvation with fear and trembling as we open ourselves by practicing the spiritual disciplines that are given to us so that we may be open to the grace of God that will sanctify us and perfect us in God's love. So we are cautioned not to be presumptuous about our salvation. We must make sure that we remain in Christ and that we may be useful to Him. Now, not only is this dependence an essential uh, connection, but this is an absolute dependence. It's essential and also absolute. It's an absolute dependence. We are totally dependent on Jesus for our well-being. And we can easily forget this because we have so many talents, we have resources and so on. But we must never forget that we are totally dependent on Christ for our well-being. From young, we are trained and urged to be competent, to succeed in life with great achievements, and we honour those who are called self-made men. But you know that is a lie. And this lie, this ideology can also carry over into the Christian life. Because when we are younger, we are challenged to do something for God. We are encouraged to make the best use of our lives, to take control of our lives, to achieve great things, whether for God or for ourselves. But as we grow older, as our strength and abilities begin to decline, we learn how to lean more heavily on God. The spiritual lesson is to know that without Christ, we cannot do anything of significance. 
The Lord Jesus Christ told Peter in John 21, verse 18, He said, Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. So the secret of this absolute dependence, as we learn to grow in Christ, we know that we are absolutely dependent on Him for every need, big and small. The secret is the vine. The Christian life is not we trying to live this secret life. It is in fact letting Christ live in us. You see, that's such an important point. It is not we trying to live the Christian life. It is to let Christ live in us this life. Galatians 2.20 is well known and well loved verse where we are told it is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. That's the secret. It's, it's sometimes called the exchanged life. It makes the difference between somebody who's anxious and trying his or her best and one who rests in God's grace and love. And then in Colossians chapter 3, verse 4, Paul says something else. Colossians 3, 4, when he refers to Christ. And so he says, when Christ, who is your life, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So the, the point here is Christ is our life. It is this Christ who lives in us and who lives through us that we find true Christian living. And the key action here is not effort, but surrender. Very important point. The key action here is not effort, but surrender. Because many Christians put in a lot of effort, but all the effort in the world without surrender to Christ is ultimately useless and fruitless. So our, our focus should be on surrender rather than effort. Because when we surrender, we discover fruitfulness, true fruitfulness. So in John 15 verse 5, Jesus reiterates the importance of abiding or remaining in Him. And then He says, then only will we bear much fruit. The branch that loses connection with the vine will wither and is thrown away because it does not bear fruit. So the key is not to focus on the fruit, but on our relationship with Jesus. So if like uh, many churches or Christians, they uh, focus primarily on uh, KPIs or key performance indicators, then our eyes are on the, on the fruit. And then after a while, we forget the root of our lives. And the root of our lives is our connection with Jesus, our relationship with Him. Neglect the roots, the fruits will be gone. So we have to be very focused on the right things. It is not effort, but surrender. It is not so much the products of our lives, but the central relationship of our lives. And that relationship is with the Lord Jesus Christ. This could be seen in some way by uh, what Andre Nouwen, that famous spiritual writer, has shared about his own life. For the first five decades of his life, he says it could be summarized in the phrase, loving God. He spent his life trying to love God. And he did a lot of things. He made quite an impact. But in his heart of hearts, he felt it was not sufficient. He felt a dissatisfaction with that way of living. And so he gave up all his academic work uh, 
and joined uh, the Daybreak Center, uh, which ministers to severely uh, mentally handicapped adults. He became a chaplain there. And he said he spent the last 10 years of his life discovering not so much how to love God, but how to receive God's love. So he is no longer the lover of God, but he is the beloved of God. And he says that that radically transformed the way he lived his life and the way he ministered. And so I think Nouwen correctly turned his attention from effort to surrender, from focusing on the fruits of his life to focusing on the roots, the relationship with Christ. So this is what it means to be one with Christ as we think about that. Now, so we could, we could summarize here. Focus is not on effort, but surrender. The focus is not on achievement, but on attachment. That's what I said earlier, that it's not so much the fruits, but to pay attention to the roots, because if we do pay attention to the roots, the fruits will come. So to pay attention to the attachment, never to lose that, never to lose that connection with Christ. Then in us and through us, God will achieve what he wants to do. And that's what exactly we will find as we follow Christ and love him with all our hearts. I want to come to some conclusion at this point by saying that before we think of anything else, and, and tomorrow we'll be looking at community, and then on the third night we'll be looking at mission. But before we think of these important areas of our lives, we must begin where we should begin. And we begin with the phrase, one with Christ. Because if we are not one with Christ, we cannot be one with each other. And then we also cannot be one in ministry to all the world. So we must begin where we ought to begin. That's the most important point, to know what it means to be one with Christ. It is possible to attempt to live the Christian life on the wrong footing. In our success-seeking and activist world, and church too, we can end up measuring our spiritual success in worldly terms. We can lift our efforts higher than our need to surrender first to Christ. And we can lift our achievements higher than our need to be attached to Him. And we must remember that without Christ, we can do nothing of lasting significance. It is important we recognize this and learn to abide in Him and continue being attached to Him by surrendering to Him. Then only then only can our lives be meaningful and fruitful. Then what the Apostle Paul wrote will come true, and that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, the last verse of that chapter, Paul says this, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Remember we talked about vanity, that if we are not rooted properly, everything that we attempt is vanity. It's all wasted. It's all in vain. But when we stand in Christ and when we are attached to Him, when we are one with Christ and continue to be one with Him as we abide in Him, then we know, we have this assurance that all that we do for Christ 
all our labor in Him is not in vain. It's never wasted. And the only thing that can assure us of that is when we abide in Christ, when we are one with Him. I want to refer uh, to two passages in the New Testament and end by looking at those two passages and uh, issuing a challenge for all of us. The first passage is, is John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, uh, there was a big crowd following Jesus. He became suddenly very popular because he fed thousands uh, miraculously. It was a fantastic miracle. And so he became instantly popular. A crowd was following Christ. And then he knew that most of them were following him for the wrong reasons, with the wrong motives. And so he issued some hard teaching to the crowd that followed him. He talked about having the need to eat his body and drink his blood and so on. Now that was very hard on the ears of those who were just clamoring to see him and, and to eat the kind of miraculous food that he is able to produce. But when they heard him, they left him. Soon the crowd thinned out and only the disciples were there. And so Jesus asked the disciples, You do not want to leave too, do you? You do not want to leave too, do you? And Peter gave a fantastic answer. He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Because you have the words of eternal life. And so Peter was basically saying, Lord, we will not leave you. We will remain with you. We will continue to be attached to you. We will follow you wherever you go because you have the words of eternal life. The second passage is in Matthew 26, verse 36 to verse 45. And this time it, it is an incident that happened in Gethsemane. We all know the story. Uh, the inner circle of Jesus, Peter, James and John were there as the Lord was praying in agony as he faced the cross. And what Jesus told them in the garden was this. He said, stay. Stay here. Now, it's the same word we came across earlier in John 15. Meno, meno, stay here and keep watch with me. Stay here and keep watch with me. But unfortunately, the three disciples fell asleep, much to the disappointment of our Lord. So it is possible to say, I will not leave you, Lord. But then after a while to fall asleep. And that's the danger. So I want to ask two questions. Are you still with Jesus? Are you still with Jesus? Or have you left to follow the crowd? It's possible to just follow and drift, follow the crowd, but to then, but to also stay with Jesus, to abide in Him, to remain in Him. Are you still with Jesus? The second question is, if you are with Him, are you awake? Are you awake? Because to remain in Christ is to remain with that kind of love that we have for Him, that pays attention to Him, that is able to listen to Him and to do what He asks us to do, to be alive to Him, to be awake to Him. Are you still united with Christ? Are you remaining in Him? Are you awake while you are doing so? It's a question that all of us are invited to answer at this point in time. And we want to spend some time thinking about this as we examine our own lives, whether we're actually one with Christ.
let not our busyness or distractions affect that reality of being one with Christ. Because if you are not one with Christ, everything else will collapse. One with Christ. By faith we are attached to Him, and by faith we remain with Him, and by faith we continue to be awake to Him, and therefore we allow our lives to bear fruit that will last. That's the expectation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let us turn to the Lord in prayer as we conclude our reflections. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for speaking to us, for reminding us of that which is most important, that we need to be attached to Jesus, united with Him. And we know, Lord, that without that being united with Him experience, everything that we do will be pointless and eventually useless. We are reminded by the Lord saying to us this evening, without me, you can do nothing. And so, Lord, let the words of Christ ring in every section of our hearts that we may hear these words and surrender ourselves to Christ. Every aspect of our lives, every plan that we have, every hope and dream that we have, every aspiration that we carry in our hearts. Oh Lord, we pray that we may surrender ourselves to Him. And as we do so, O oh Lord, we know that You will take care of the fruits. The fruitfulness comes to a life that is surrendered. And Lord, we also remind ourselves that it's not so much our achievements that ultimately matters, but it's our attachment to Christ. And so keep us focused on the right things, O Lord, and help us to watch the roots of our lives, even as we long to bear the fruits in our lives. Lord, bless us, speak to us, and help us to be awake to you that we can truly say that we are one with Christ. May each of us be able to say with conviction that I am, by the grace of God, one with Christ. To that end, we pray all this, Father, in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen.